You're listening to the Neuroscience of Meditation, an Optimal Living interview with Richie Davidson and Brian Johnson. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome back to the Optimal Living interview series. Today, I'm thrilled to be chatting with Richie Davidson, one of the world's leading authorities and really the founder in, in, of the neuroscience movement. Um, we're going to talk about some of my favorite big ideas from the emotional life of your brain. We have a short amount of time this morning, so I'm going to jump straight in. Richie, thank you so much for taking the time. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to start with um, the emotional life of your brain. Can you tell us um, what you were thinking as you as you named the book that? Well, uh, the book is really a summary of 30 years of research uh, from the neuroscience laboratory, uh, and it gave me an opportunity to reflect on on what we had discovered over that long period of time. And uh, we think that it's information that is valuable for each and every person to know about him or herself. Uh, I talk about six different styles of emotional responding. All of us have each of these styles. We differ in the extent to which the style is expressed. Uh, And so uh, just to give a few examples, one style is resilience, and resilience reflects the rapidity or the speed with which you recover from adversity. Some people recover quickly and other people recover more slowly. Um, uh, And this turns out to be a very key attribute of well-being. The more quickly you can recover from adversity, the higher levels of well-being you have. And one of the things we've learned about each of these emotional styles is that they are instantiated in specific brain circuits, and these circuits are plastic. That is, they are shaped by experience, and they can also be shaped by training so that we can actually learn to become more resilient. Uh, And all of this, by the way, inevitably leads to the conclusion that well-being actually is a skill. We don't normally think of well-being as a skill, but all of this work uh, leads us inevitably to that conclusion. So just to continue on, I'll, I'll just mention two other emotional styles out of the six. Um, the second one we call outlook or positive outlook, and it reflects the extent to which a person uh, views the world through more a more positive lens, uh, the extent to which a person is able to savor positive experiences the extent to which they can regard another person as uh, sharing the same basic wish to be happy as they have. Uh, This kind of positive orientation turns out to be uh, extraordinarily important for well-being, and we understand something about the brain mechanisms that underlie it. Uh, A third emotional style, something we don't normally think of as being within the realm of emotional style, is attention. And to... um, Uh, quote a subtitle of a recent scientific article on this topic, a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. Hmm. Uh, And so uh, the greater ability we have to focus our attention to be in the present moment, uh, the happier we are. Uh, And that also fundamentally contributes to our well-being and is also something that can be learned. Uh, William James in 1890, in his classic two-volume tome, The Principles of Psychology, talks about how attention can be educated. And um, using very simple uh, meditation practices that come from the mindfulness tradition, we and other scientists have clearly shown that different attributes of attention can be learned. Hmm. This is so good. And there's so much we can talk about. Richie founded both effective neuroscience, the field of effective neuroscience, studying the emotional styles, as we just very briefly discussed, and then contemplative neuroscience. Um, And I just love your own personal story over the last 30 years and your own hero's journey, really, as you explored um, those different uh, aspects of optimal living. Um, I want to jump into the practice. So two things that you talk about a lot in the book. are cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive therapy and um, mindfulness meditation as ways we can train our minds um, to cultivate and optimize our emotional styles. Can you talk to us about cognitive therapy? Sure. Cognitive therapy is probably the most empirically well-validated psychological treatment for depression and anxiety. 
Uh, and it basically involves teaching people to um, think differently about the causes of their behavior. Um, so uh, if something bad happens, if we undergo some stressful event, some, and there are some negative consequences, uh, some people attribute those to internal causes. They, um, uh, they regard it as a sign that they're not a very effective person, that they may not be smart, and so forth. Um, and uh, that's attributing it to these stable and internal causes. Uh, if we can train our mind to uh, not regard it in that way, but to reappraise the situation as maybe um, the situation was unfair, maybe if, for example, you didn't do well on an exam uh, or a job interview, maybe the examiner or the interview was simply unfair and that most people would also not do well in that situation. So rather than attributing it to causes within yourself, attributing it to causes that are more transient in the environment. Um, and so a person can be trained in that way to think differently about the causes of these events and um, change their mood and behavior as a consequence. So those are some of the elements that are key to cognitive therapy. It's kind of cognitive retraining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And I love how often you use the word train, right? If we want to uh, you know, achieve excellence in our, in our mental, emotional style, it, it requires training, hard work, right? Um, can, can you share with us kind of your favorite uh, practice, the actual practical thing that one can do within the realm of cognitive therapy? Uh, well, within the realm of cognitive therapy, uh, I, the, I think the most important is to, um, to engage in perspective taking. Uh, sometimes we get so locked into things that we think we're the only ones suffering and experiencing these kinds of problems and taking a, a broader perspective and understanding that um, most people in this circumstance would probably have very similar feelings. And so it's not really about me. Um, uh, and that can really help to uh, give uh, some distance and, and uh, enable some leverage in the situation. That's awesome. So kind of the common humanity, I think uh, that phrase, yeah. just, you were not alone. That was huge for me as I went through my own issues and just realizing it's not about me. It's not a function of me. It's a function of being human. <laughs> These things arise. Right. And Absolutely. How do we respond? Um, let's, um, let's talk about mindfulness meditation uh, and the power of mindfulness meditation. Again, it's exciting for me to chat with you and for our audience to hear you as, as you know, the, the kind of father of the contemplative neuroscience movement. What have we learned? Um, and then we'll get into some of the practical stuff. Well, what we've learned is that we can use the simple tool of our own mind uh, to recognize this, the, this basic quality of awareness uh, that we all have, as well as uh, basic qualities of what I call innate basic goodness, that um, human beings are endowed with a propensity to um, be kind toward others and to prefer warm-hearted, um, uh, altruistic kinds of interactions compared to those that are selfish. Uh, uh, and there's increasing scientific evidence that supports that conjecture. Uh, and so um, uh, this practice is really about recognizing those qualities and nurturing them. And we can think of these qualities in a way that's very similar to language. Each of us is born with a capability for language. It's part of the human biological repertoire, but it requires us being raised in a normal linguistic community in order for that propensity to be nourished and expressed. And there have been case studies of uh, kids raised in the wild as feral children without a normal language community around them, and they don't learn to speak correctly. Uh, uh, and the same could be said for these basic qualities of mindfulness and kindness. Um, they require nurturing by uh, uh, a supportive environment. And if um, that supportive environment is present, these incipient capabilities can flourish. Uh, and so the training is really about strengthening and nurturing these seeds that already exist in each of us. 
Yeah, that's so inspiring. And um, before we get into the practical side of meditation, I, I want to step back and you, you used another great metaphor of the music collections, talking about, you know, which music is played is going to determine how, how our genetic code is expressed. Um, can you talk to us about that a little bit for people who may think, well, yeah, but I was just kind of born this way and there's not a lot I can do? Well, uh, as we have learned um, with regard to the brain, we, we talk about neuroplasticity, the idea that the brain changes in response to experience and in response to training. And um, in, in similar ways, the, the, uh, uh, that same concept can be applied to genomics. So we are all born with a fixed complement of base pairs, which is our DNA, um, and that's pretty much not going to change. But what will change is the extent to which different genes are turned on or turned off. We can think of genes having little volume controls. And um, the setting on those volume controls is highly malleable, and it's influenced by experience. Uh, we know that the way, for example, a mother treats her offspring will induce these what we call epigenetic changes in the offspring. It will regulate the genes of the offspring. It will set the volume controls. And, um, uh, and so there's a lot more plasticity at the genomic level than we ever thought was possible before. Hmm. Um, and uh, we've published a recent paper, for example, showing that one day of intensive meditation among long-term meditation practitioners it was sufficient to detect an actual alteration in gene expression. Wow. <laughs> so the mother can not only affect her child, but herself through these activities that we're talking about. Now your research is Absolutely. all Absolutely. Yeah, that's Absolutely. unbelievably inspiring. And again, we can talk about that for a weekend and you do. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so let's go back to the mindfulness training. Uh, in meditation, if someone is either aspiring to create a meditation practice or to deepen their practice, um, what tips would you give them? Well, we often talk about a, um, first of all, more generally to cultivate well-being, a 531 tip. Um, and uh, here's what the 531 refers to. Uh, spend five minutes a day in a simple mindfulness practice. And uh, it could be as simple as bringing your awareness to your breathing or bringing your awareness to bodily sensations and just simply paying attention um, without uh, reacting, um, uh, without trying to change what exists, just simply being aware. Uh, so that's the five minutes. And then uh, the three refers to uh, three acts of gratitude. Um, uh, and so uh, simply um, pay attention to three um, um, periods of gratitude during your day. Uh, and uh, we all have these. Um, they often go unnoticed. And this is an invitation to bring them more into your awareness. <clears throat> and the one refers to engage in at least one act of kindness uh, each day. And uh, this simple 531 prescription is something that really doesn't take a lot. Um, the only thing that requires you to do anything uh, outside your normal activities is the five minutes, but even that five minutes can be done while you're commuting, it can be done while you're walking, uh, it doesn't need to be um, in any special place. Um, uh, it's really spending five minutes bringing your awareness into your body, into your breathing. Um, and uh, if if everyone did this uh, regularly every day, I honestly believe the world would be a different place. Hmm. And it's 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 not that hard. Um, and so uh, our aspiration is that this kind of mental exercise will be as commonly practiced in a few years as physical exercise is today. Hmm. Inspiring five three one. Um realize we, we have limited time. Is there anything else that you think is important to share in this context? Uh, you know, I think I've given some good tidbits. Uh, I don't think there's much more I need to follow Fantastic. up with. Well, where can people learn more about you? Obviously, I highly recommend The Emotional Life of Your Brain. Um, so listeners, check out the notes on that um, and the book, wherever you buy your books. Um, and where's the best place for people to learn more about you and your work? Uh, at our website, uh, which is uh, Center 
for healthyminds.org uh, and uh, you can learn all about what we're doing. It's center, actually it's center health, we have a new web address, it's centerhealthyminds.org, all one word, centerhealthyminds.org. And then dot org. Fantastic. Centerhealthyminds.org. Richie, thank you so much for taking the time and thank you for dedicating your life to such important work. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Hi, this is Brian. A lot of people don't know all the stuff I do beyond these free videos I share on YouTube. So I thought I'd do a quick video to give you an overview of our membership program that you can get access to and get a ton of other stuff. Uh, so here's a quick look 10 bucks a month. Join the Optimal Living Membership Program. You get instant access to 250 philosopher's notes on some of the best optimal living books out there. Old school classics, positive psychology, modern stuff, mindfulness, peak performance, purpose, neuroscience, wealth, etc. Um, and what you may not know is that in addition to the PNTV episodes, I create PDFs on all of these great books. So six-page PDFs. Let's take a look at one of them. Joseph Campbell. You want to figure out how to live your hero's journey. Well, this is a great place to start. I basically pull out my favorite big ideas, riff on them, connect them to other books and other ideas, and help you apply this wisdom to your life today. That's what the PDF looks like. Again, we have 250 of these on all these different great books. And then I record those PDFs as an MP3. So you can listen to that MP3 while you're on a walk or working out or doing some errands or whatever. Um, that is Philosopher's Notes. Uh, a lot going on there. And then in addition to Philosopher's Notes, you get access to Optimal Living classes, Optimal Living 101. Idea here is that all those great teachers come back to the same big ideas again and again and again. I distill those ideas into classes. Super practical, fun, inspiring classes, ranging from Habits 101, Confidence 101, Getting Stuff Done 101, Meditation 101, instant access to all those classes. And then future classes include Relationships 101, Energy 101, Purpose 101, Business, Goals, etc. Those are our full-length classes. And then I create micro-classes, two to three to five-minute little bursts of wisdom on my favorite great ideas from these great books across the domain that you want to optimize in your life. So we have dozens of these so far. I create 50 new micro classes every month and 10 new philosopher's notes every month for 10 bucks a month. So we're blessed to have thousands of members who are uh, enjoying the program and sharing some incredibly kind words with us. And uh, super simple, 10 bucks a month, cancel any time. Would be honored to be a bigger part of your life, and I appreciate your support. And uh, here's to optimizing and actualizing.